When I travel through Israel on a bus, I like to open the Waze app so that I can glance back and forth between the view of that which I am witnessing out the window and my phone so that I can, re I can relearn the names of some of the smaller communities that we are driving through or passing by. And I also have, uh, I really don't like being on buses. I have terrible motion sickness. I want to be able to anticipate traffic and traffic jams so I know when the bus will be in stop and go traffic so I can sort of breathe and prepare myself. Because of the ceasefire that was, that Hamas has broken and is now over, Israel was somewhat more alive during my visit over the past few days than it had been in the weeks prior. Around Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, we spent a lot of time in traffic that could not have happened two or three weeks ago. And when I looked at my Waze app where I should have seen thick red lines, I only saw blue as if I was on totally empty roads. I would be stopped in a traffic jam looking at no cars on my app. During war, the traffic feature is turned off in Israel. Never let them know where many targets may be gathered in one place. This is a new Israel for me. Israelis right now view their history as one comprising of four days. October 6th, a deeply fractured society on the verge of breaking. Civil war was a term I heard used quite often in two days. October 7th, the loss of what so many thought to be true about their borders, the illusion of safety completely shattered, replaced with grief and a heavy dose of fear. October 8th, the day the war began, and the day the civil fracture of October 6th was bandaged up and a national unity reemerged, and world Jewry, for the most part, turned back to the East in a way it hadn't, likely since 1967. October 6th, October 7th, October 8th, and the fourth day is called the day after. The day after, I heard every Israeli I spoke to talked about the day after. It's a day that may come in two weeks or two months, could be longer. It's an unknown date the day after, but everyone wants to talk about the day after. Maybe it's hope, but I never felt hopeful when I heard somebody talk about the day after, nor did I feel hope coming from those who would speak it. I think talking about the day after is a momentary sliver of relief from living fully in an unbearable present. Over and over and over again, there is a dark combination of the seventh and the eighth informed by the disarray of the sixth. Until every hostage is home, until Hamas is defeated, eliminated, removed from power, whatever defeated actually means, there's disagreement about that. This is the Israel that I experienced for two and a half days. The trauma and the grief is so thick, it is so palpable. I found it hard to believe I was breathing the same air as I did even two years ago when I visited with a Federation Solidarity Mission right after the last war with Gaza. October 7th, we often compare it to the Holocaust or something around the Holocaust, but it didn't feel like that at all to me. It felt more like Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the destruction of the temple which forever changed the way Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, lived its Judaism or understood its peoplehood in the context of land and place. And so while so much of the world tragically and immorally has forgotten the unthinkable atrocities perpetrated on October 7th, Am Yisrael will never live without that day piercing through our hearts. Tali Levanon of the Israel Trauma Coalition, an organization that was founded in 2001 during the beginning of the second intifada, a time that I lived in Israel, talked to our group in a hotel turned makeshift absorption center for refugees about how difficult her work is now. Every single Israeli is traumatized, yet she's got 40 counselors total. None of them trained for this moment in particular, all of them themselves traumatized by the brutality of October 7th. 
October 7th changed our lives, she said. Every perception we had on the 6th is broken. Even hope. There's no going back, only trying to bounce forward. But all of the tools we need to do that are missing. She continued, we generally give our patients stability through routine and familiarity. How can we do that during war when communities are split up across the country, living in hotels and kibbutzim, away from our lives and our jobs and our schools, bouncing forward, resilience, which is the key to trauma work, it requires conditions we certainly don't have. So more than anything else, we just try to hold space for people to tell their stories, to bear witness, to see their pain. And it was really obvious in our meeting with her that that was therapy for her own trauma. The trauma counselors are traumatized. We became witness to her grief and her heartache and her work is extraordinary. The Israel Trauma Coalition is heavily supported by our local federation. A good amount of the emergency money that has been raised has already made it to the efforts that they are desperately seeking to enact on the ground. Sitting around the dinner table in Jerusalem an hour before we left for Ben Gurion Airport, one of our trip organizers, Elisa Deneregis, chief of staff of our local federation asked us eight rabbis from the DC area, I just have a simple question for you. What will you take back with you? <laughs> Two and a half days, almost entirely in ruins or buses. It's not a simple question. How do I faithfully communicate this deep trauma, pain, fear, shattered trust, unity, both thick and fragile, unbridled anger, resilience, overflowing gratitude, large doses of clarity and confusion that I witnessed. How do I faithfully communicate that to a group of people in a reasonable amount of time? And I just, I need you to know that I can't do it. I am still shaken from what it is I experienced on the ground. And in other ways, I've never felt so connected. So as a sermon, I don't quite know where to begin. I only know that I will not be able to talk about everything. And some of you will feel I should have talked about this or that. And maybe at some point I will. But everything probably comes down to one reality. S came out of Sam's Torah portion. Jacob did become Yisrael in his struggle with Elohim the Anashim, with God and man. But he left with a limp, a permanent limp, a scar, a scar from which he never recovered, but wasn't talked about later on. It's impossible to read about Yisrael after Jacob without thinking about the fact that he had been through some kind of battle and was left permanently wounded. It informed every decision that he made. Naomi, a young mother of two who is now a refugee, one of several hundred thousand displaced Israelis staying in Mishmar HaEmek, a kibbutz up north. She's from Nachal Oz, a community of 400 just yards from Gaza. Naomi hid in her safe room with her three young sons for 18 hours while Hamas terrorists infiltrated their kibbutz to murder, maim, kidnap as much as they possibly could. She hunkered down and she listened to residents of Gaza who came across the border in the mayhem to loot and destroy her home, as many did in areas in the south before the IDF was able to take control back. Until October 7th, Naomi's husband worked the banana fields of Nahalos side by side with Gazan residents, all holding machetes every day, all day, without ever worrying about one of those blades touching one another or being pointed at one another. They were friends and they believed deeply in coexistence. Her forever scar, her eternal and figurative limp, she said, I grieve for who I was before October 7th. I, gr I grieve for the person who once gave the benefit of the doubt 
as much as I could. I grieve the confidence I once had. I grieve the future I once thought possible. On Wednesday, we spent a couple of hours walking through Kfar Aza, also close to the border. Kfar Aza lost 62 people murdered. 19 were taken captive. Over the course of four days, 300 terrorists brutalized this kibbutz. Amlas Chen, Abraham Kotler, was our guide. She has lived in Kfaraza her whole life, but she found herself in Portugal on October 7th. Her entire family lived, resides in the kibbutz of about 900 residents. All of the generations, brothers, sisters, cousins, kids, grandchildren, together. She walked us through her little neighborhood in the kibbutz. Now a wasteland, burnt furniture everywhere, the smell of smoke still lingering two months later. A still standing sukkah, perfectly put together in the middle of all of it. It took the IDF five full days in Kfaraza to clear out all the booby traps, the bombs, the grenades that Hamas left in microwaves, ovens, refrigerators, washing machines, anything that could possibly ignite it once they were gone. As she is walking us through the obliterated young adult village, reading from the WhatsApp text thread of kids begging for help, in this row of little cute homes, they must have been, where many were killed and seven were kidnapped, a group of soldiers walk by. The kibbutz is now being used as a makeshift base. She stopped talking to us and closely looked at each one of them as they walked by. And time stopped for just a moment. I want to recognize them if I see their picture among the dead in the newspaper. I want to know them, each and every one of them defending us. I too started looking more closely at every soldier that passed me by. At Asuta Hospital in Ashdod, home to the newest and most acclaimed emergency medical center in Israel, also generously supported by our Federation dollars, we met Moshe from Sterot, a volunteer ambulance driver for United Hatzola, Israel's community-based volunteer emergency medical service organization, also a recipient of our money. He is recovering from a deep shrapnel wound from a Hamas rocket, a literal leg wound. On the morning of October 7th, Moshe tells us he didn't wait for instructions or requests for help to come in. He heard about what was happening, got into his car, and drove toward the Nova Music Festival, one of the several ground zero locations of October 7th. As he saw bullet-ridden cars racing from the direction of the festival, he drove not away with them, but towards it to try and save lives. He was a medic, and when he finally arrived, he spent four hours walking through hundreds of bodies searching for somebody to save, and he found not one. I can't describe in any detail here precisely what he told us he saw. You can call me if you want to hear those details. But Moshe will never, ever, ever be the same, a forever limp in his soul. Even after that, he didn't turn around and go home. He drove straight to Kibbutz Be'eri and stayed there treating people for four days while the fighting was going on. And he was one of the first people in Israel I heard explicitly say, I will need a lot of therapy to live with this wound. There's also a national scar living inside every single one of the folks that we met with, something we've read about but I hadn't really internalized. A covenant has been broken between Israeli citizens and their government and their army. Amir Tibon, a refugee from Kibbutz Nachal Oz, who lived in the DC area for three years as his wife Miri was a shlicha in Virginia. They're sheltering in Mishmar HaEmek up north. This is what Amir said, our trust is broken. On October 6th, we had 150% trust in the military. On October 8th, zero. We had a sacred covenant with the government. We will tend to the southern borders. We assume the risk of living here. We help this land thrive. And you, all you have to do is protect us. It took the military 10 hours to get here, he said. 
and other nearby kibbutzim soldiers arrived much sooner than that, but waited outside while communities were decimated, waiting for orders. The covenant with the military is making a comeback, as so many Israelis are part of the overall effort, war, the war effort right now. And the vast majority of Israelis see no other option but to keep fighting and end the threat of Hamas terror. Israelis are mostly united in that effort. The same cannot be said of the government and the prime minister. Not one person we met didn't hold some kind of deep distrust, even a hatred for this government, including many of those who might have supported it on October 6th, the day after many told, us, many told us, we'll have to be a reckoning for what happened to us on their watch, but not until the day after. And as is often the case with injury, and even with the process of healing, other faculties emerge, like gratitude. I've been to Israel or lived there for extended periods since I was a kid. And I always felt like when I went to Israel, Israelis would sort of look at us like people coming to the aquarium and pat us on the head, and it was this top-down type thing of, oh, look, they're coming to see how we do it in Israel. Not this time. Not this time. It was like we had finally found a lost people on a deserted island. Lo muvan me'alav. We don't take it for granted that you are here. Thank you. We heard this a lot. Lo muvan me'alav. It means the world to us that you came during a war. We have never felt so alone as Israelis. The gratitude was overflowing. Vayivater Yaakov levado, and Yaakov was left alone. Vayomer lo ashal checha ki im berachtani. I will not let you go until you bless me. Every single Israeli we talked to gushed about President Joe Biden. They felt his authentic love and his support. I heard we know it might cost him politically, that makes it even more special. And so this is why we continue to walk forward even with a forever limp of October 7th. Ein Brera, we have no choice. Whether we are Yisrael or Yaakov or Yisrael, our story isn't over. It's just forever changed. Like every other forever changed date in Jewish history, Yisrael isn't going anywhere even when he is Jacob and Jacob will always be just underneath Yisrael. Neither will ever be the same, nor will we. And I am just beginning to understand that once again. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>